in terms of positioning the resilient supply chain uh, from everybody's on the same page, everybody's motivated to try and understand risk and work on processes to minimise that risk in the event of the event actually arrives. As we look at the normal level of engagement a business might be having in managing risk, because I think this is going to be the, the big question. It has been cost for a long, long time, for decades, we've been focused on costs. I think we're going to move very quickly to managing risks. What would you say are the stages a business passes through from, let's call it nonchalant, that don't really really have any appreciation of risk, right up to fully engaged where perhaps in the future that's where we're all going to be uh, moving steadily towards? I think it's an evolution. I think it depends on two key things. I think as risk leaders, it's important for us to ask all of our organizations, how much risk are you willing to take? And there's a trade-off in terms of pros and cons. I think it has to match the culture. You know, some banks have armed guards at the front of their entrances that matches the culture. If you try to do that in some of your organizations, that wouldn't work for a whole bunch of reasons. So it's up to us as risk leaders to point out the risks and give the business the option of choosing which risks they want to mitigate and how with the tactics that we uh, suggest to them and let the business decide. You don't own the risk. Your business owns the risk. And I made that mistake for a long time at, at some of the companies I work with. I thought, I thought I owned the risk. It's up to me to assess the risk, give my company's options to mitigate the risk, and let the companies choose which mitigation options they want to choose. Obviously, if the risk comes to fruition, then I'm responsible to respond and recover from risks. Welcome, and thank you for joining me today. My name is Gary Newberry. I'm a senior executive on call, helping businesses in the make, move, sell flow of consumer goods and services. My purpose is to inspire business leaders, particularly those within the consumer products and retailing space, to think big, be bold, scale, adapt and win, one epic supply chain transformation at a time. There's additional content available through my website, retailaid.ca, or on my YouTube channel, Retail Aid. Be sure to check it out. As a business world faces much volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, organizations need to be tapping into resources with an inside edge on transitioning their teams to be agile, innovative, and digital, with thought leaders, experts, and senior executives who have mastery of operational turnarounds and strategic transformations to help reorientate their enterprises. There's great material to get through here, so let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our session today, 2030 Supply Chain Resilience. My name is Dean Correa. I'm an emeritus faculty with the Security Executive Council, and my passion for the last 30 years is helping businesses and supply chains be safe and secure by protecting their people, assets, products, and information. I live in the Halton region of Ontario, and as we know it today, the Halton region is rich in the history and modern traditions of many First Nations and the Métis, from the lands of the Anishinaabe to the Attawandaran, the Haudenosaunee, and the Métis. These lands surrounding the Great Lakes are steeped in indigenous history. We acknowledge and thank the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation for being stewards of this traditional territory. Welcome again, and I'll pass it over to my colleague, Gary Newberry. Thanks, Dean. Uh, I'm delighted to be here to host this session. Uh, my name is Gary Newbury. I'm a senior exec on call, specialising in rapid performance improvement across retail supply chains and the last mile. I help boards and business leaders to navigate disruption, and we've got plenty right now, and to reinvigorate supply chain performance. So let's get straight into this. Dean. You've had a long and successful career across security, loss prevention and risk management, very pertinent to today's conference theme. Uh, would you be able to highlight some of the key points in your journey which shaped your current thoughts and how you approach these three areas within an end-to-end -end retail supply chain context? Sure. Thanks, Gary. Like most people, I learned the hard way and experience is the best teacher. So uh, everything from uh, Hurricane Katrina to uh, one of our key suppliers for one of my previous companies uh, going out of business and us not being able to get the safes that we needed for the stores and having to source them and scramble like crazy to source them and bring across the border. 
it's really, really been in, entrenched and, and embedded for me over time that uh, a resilient supply chain, a secure supply chain, and an informed supply chain is absolutely critical for uh, retailers coast to coast, regardless of where you reside. And uh, I've been uh, working on that with my clients for a number of years, and uh, especially with COVID, it's uh, it's a never-ending challenge, and it's it needs to be a top strategic focus. Uh, from the boardroom right to the plant floor every single day. Okay, so you mentioned resilience. So when we think about resilient supply chain, could you give a few examples to help the audience understand some of the practical actions they can take back to their businesses and potentially implement? And perhaps can you share some of the situations you've experienced firsthand and help sure. your clients overcome their challenges? Yeah, absolutely, Gary. Thanks for that. So I, I think there's three, when I think about a resilient supply chain and what I've learned and what I've experienced through the last uh, few decades is there's three main uh, points and proven practices to keeping your supply chain resilient. The first is evaluate the pros and cons of single sourcing versus multi-sourcing. And I know there's uh, cost is a key factor when we all do that equation, but as we're seeing now in the Port of Los Angeles example, you know, outsourcing and the, the 50 or 60 ships or whatever it might be that are um, almost stationary, if not uh, moving at a snail pace, the cost of now renting your own container, if you have the, uh, the, the means to do that, is exponential versus what it was a year ago. So I think you have to weigh the pros and cons versus cost and speed to market versus single sourcing and multi-sourcing. And a lot of companies that I've worked with and, and been employed by have gone outside of Canada, outside of North America for mostly cost and efficiency and speed of production benefits. But I think you have to look at maybe coming closer to home, especially during COVID, especially seeing what we're now seeing and making your supply chain uh, more resilient. And whether that's uh, a 70-30 outsource versus a uh, single source uh, equation or a 65-35, you have to balance being able to get the products. No one likes an empty shelf, especially going into the peak sales period uh, for every retailer in the world right now. So I think a lot of people are really thinking having more of a balance between single sourcing, local sourcing uh, versus sourcing outside of the, the continent or the country. And number two is really ask yourselves, how well do you know your suppliers? If one of your key suppliers went belly up, financially belly up, had a disaster at one of their key manufacturing or supplier plants, how quickly would it take you to recover? Weeks? Months? So I think one of the opportunities is sometimes something that we don't think about as often as we should is baking into the procurement process a supplier resilience questionnaire. If you ask a supplier to pass over their business continuity plan, they're probably not gonna give it to you for a whole bunch of reasons. But if you ask them top 10 top questions and bake that into the procurement process and make that a requirement of them doing any sort of contracting with you, you're gonna get out of those 10 key questions all the information that you want. Your supply chain is only as resilient as your supplier's supply chain. So how confident are you on that supply chain being resilient and them being able to supply you going back two or three layers on that fishbone diagram that we all love to talk about in supply chain? Before you go on to the third point, sorry to interrupt you, but say for instance, what, what would be a good question to ask a supplier, but which would trip them into disclosing something about their ability to be resilient themselves or to at least fend off an attack they run out of money or an attack by cyber criminals yeah so good question so again some of the key cyber questions you know how, how well protected is your data what how, how do you back up your data but ask them who their three key suppliers are and how and how resilient and how confident they are in their three key suppliers what happens if their main manufacturing plant goes down one of my clients their key supply is chickens i learned just recently you can't transport chickens if it's too hot or too cold. So then what? So what's the plan B? How do we get chicken to various restaurants around, uh, around the country if there is an issue with chicken supply, whether it's a weather issue, whether it's something planned or unplanned? So you have to go at least, my advice, at least one, if not two layers back in the companies that supply you and ask them, who are your key suppliers? How well do you know them? And what are your backups? Should one of those key supplies fail? They have a disruption, a labor dispute, a pandemic, whatever it might be. And then the third point from, from in terms of the resilience formula for me is involve your key suppliers in your annual mock incident exercises. A lot of companies do a mock incident exercise 
you know, if your manufacturing plant has an explosion, if you have a workplace violence situation at one of your uh, key uh, offices, but involve some of your key suppliers, get them into the picture and involve them and get them to help you with one of your uh, key top, it's called a table, in the industry, we call it, in the security industry, we call it a tabletop exercise. So when you do that annual tabletop exercise as an organization, bring in your suppliers and see how they would react, how they would support you, or you might be able to see how they wouldn't be able to support you if you have a major supply power outage, a supply issue. You know, most, most one of the first things most companies do is they'll get a service level agreement for diesel for their generator. However, if you don't have a service level agreement, it doesn't matter how big your organization is, everyone's gonna want diesel for their backup generators if it's a widespread catastrophe. So have that service level agreement, but can they actually execute the service level agreement? So things like that, and you're not gonna know that unless you bring them into the conversation when you're having this mock incident exercise. In terms of positioning a resilient supply chain uh, from everybody's on the same page, everybody's motivated to try and understand risk and work on processes to, to minimize that risk in the event of the event, whatever the event is that's being predicted actually arrives. But as, you, as we look at the normal level of engagement a business might be having in managing risk, because I think this is going to be the, the big question. It has been, as you mentioned earlier on, cost for a long, long time, for decades, we've been focused on costs. I think we're going to move very quickly to managing risks. What would you say are the stages a business passes through from, let's say, let's call it nonchalant, but don't really really have any appreciation of risk right up to fully engaged where perhaps in the future that's where we're all going to be uh, moving steadily towards yeah no that's a, that's a great question i think it's an evolution i think it depends on two key things i think as risk leaders it's important for us to ask all of our organizations how much risk are you willing to take you know when we leave our front door every morning we can decide to lock the front door or not lock the front door depend we can get an alarm we can do all kinds of things to better, you know, fortify our house. Same thing with a business and everything. There's a trade-off in terms of pros and cons. I think it has to match the culture. You know, some banks have armed guards at the front of their entrances that matches the culture. If you try to do that in some of your organizations, that wouldn't work for a whole bunch of reasons. So it's up to us as risk leaders to point out the risks and give the business the option of choosing which risks they want to mitigate and how with the tactics that we uh, suggest to them and let the business decide. Because as leaders out there that are at this conference and listening to this session, don't forget, we don't own the risk. You don't own the risk. Your business owns the risk. And I made that mistake for a long time at, at some of the companies I work with. I thought, I thought I owned the risk. It's up to me to assess the risk, give my companies options to mitigate the risk, and let the companies choose which mitigation options they want to choose. Then obviously, if something comes to fruition, a risk comes to fruition, then I'm responsible to respond and recover from the risks. On a daily, weekly, monthly basis, I think it starts at strategic planning time. I think just as you plan for operations and people and product, you need to add risk into that occasion. How are we going to plan for risks for this next 12 months? What are the top three foreseeable risks? How are we going to mitigate it? And then boil it down based on what you see your top three risks to be in terms of actioning them at the manufacturing or plant or warehouse site by doing some audits, doing some assessments, thinking about how technology can help. You know, whether it's drones, RFID, various seals on containers, cameras that can help with that, right? And then you proactively have this discussion every quarter. A risk assessment is not something that should be done and then left on the shelf. It's not something you should worry about when there's a category four hurricane bearing down on your facility or a wildfire in Kelowna, um, whatever it might be, or the Red River in Manitoba rising and, and, you know, causing some anxiety regarding flooding. That's not the time to be worried about supply and supply chain and insecurity you have to uh, have that plan in place in a situation where the leadership team expect you to be doing that work behind the scenes and just giving them options to, to manage a risk how about a situation where as a security professional or supply chain professional you start to really get a good idea having come off from this stay and thinking there's some real big things here and I want to take them back and start talking to my leadership team about these. How would you suggest uh, some um, audience members might actually broach that conversation if it's not a cultural conversation to, to have been having had up to this point? 
Right. I think, well, I think it happens two times. My experience tells me, you know, Gary, it happens for two reasons, proactively as part of the, the normal business practice or reactively after an incident. And it's going to be a combination of both, right? There's no situation where a site is Fort Knox. Um, so you're going to have some incidents. And then after, from a cultural point of view, you're going to have to explain to your employees how we're now better than we were kind of that situation. But I think proactively, it has to be a database decision. Whether it's, what does your shrink say? What do your audits say? What do your alarm reports say? What are your people telling you? Your people are going to be your weakest link or your strongest link. And they'll let you know what risks are most important. And it has to be customized. You know, risks in Edmonton are different than risks in St. John's and risks in Montreal. And, you know, the scope of the solution has to fit the scope of the risk. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Sam Walton. Obviously, I, my background is Gap, Starbucks, and Walmart. And Sam used to always say, if you want to solve all your business problems, ask your employees and ask your customers. They'll tell you what's going on. So I think it's a blend, focus groups, anonymous incident reporting, audits, looking at your numbers, and then presenting that to leadership and saying, these are some people, process, and technology risks that I see, and here's, uh, here's some ways to uh, help mitigate them. So really uh, coming forward with not only the problem, but the solution as well to kind of soften the blow of, of that first conversation when risk hasn't been uh, part of the normal discourse within the organisation. So we touched on earlier for quite some time, we've been very much focused on cost uh, and we can see the repercussions of just squeezing everything down, leaning everything down to the bare minimum. So we've got no plan B. So we just hope that everything just works as perfectly as it did yesterday. Uh, and now we see, uh, as you mentioned, about 60 boats up off the coast of uh, Los Angeles. Now, as you're working with clients and, and perhaps talking to other colleagues in the security field, risk management field, how, how are you seeing and reflecting on those, uh, those views? How are you seeing that, that blend of thinking about costs exclusively to thinking about risk now? How, how are you seeing that developing uh, it with during the pandemic and what do you think might happen over the next few months particularly as we go into peak and as we try to recover from from let's say a less than successful peak uh, where, where we will be very much focused on our profitability which means our cost what what would you say would be the the point as you would point to on that internal conversation to have to have with each other yeah, that's, that's, that's a really, that's a really good one, Gary. I think there's been, I think there's maybe too much trust before COVID too much trust one, three, four layers down on a supply chain in terms of what's happening, you know, outside of your province, outside of your country, outside of your continent. And I think that for a whole bunch of reasons, people are looking, what I'm hearing is people are looking to partner and to gather intelligence on a more just in time basis. I think that Collective knowledge will always win. And I think we're really what we're learning from the pandemic is, especially in supply chain, find out what the proven practices are. Talk to your neighbors. It doesn't matter if it's a competitor, somebody that's in your industry or not in your industry, um, share. Uh, because we're all in this, uh, in this together in, in terms of uh, getting products to the shelves and uh, items uh, in, the, in the hands of customers that we want. And I think that uh, where there's maybe potentially a bit more too, trust, too trusting of an environment, so I think there's a lot more rigor being adapted. And I think that there's more collaboration than I've ever personally seen. Industries like Supply Chain Canada, um, organizations, both small and uh, all the way to uh, major continent-wide organizations to learn from each other, share, again, from a people process, technology, what's not working, what has worked. And I think it's incumbent upon uh, all of us to do that and, and share. I agree. We burst into a whole bunch of collaboration. We, we would... You know, two years ago, we wouldn't think possible. Certainly during the early stages of the pandemic, we saw that the, you know, the major grocers, you know, Loblaws, Metro, uh, Sobeys, as well as Walmart and Costco, trying to force stuff onto their shelves. They had to turn to, as a collective, to the big food manufacturers and say, look, what can you give us as a collective, as opposed to, you know, Walmart or Costco, you know, bring right. the table, you must right. give us and give us right. preference. So that was... A... Yeah, no one had COVID planned, right, Gary? No one had it. We didn't have a playbook yeah. for COVID. It doesn't matter who you were. You know, we haven't been through anything globally to this magnitude. So I think that, you know, uh, there's very... In my experience, even as a security professional, there's very, very few processes or um, procedures that are really, truly intellectual property. 
And I think that uh, a lot of people are realizing that uh, there's very little you can't share. And when you do share, you win, your yes. country wins, your company wins, and uh, it, we're all better for it. So uh, especially when you consider speed through that last mile, um, I think there's some innovation. It's great to create a blue ocean. Sometimes it's okay to be second or third to the dance. And I think we're, we're learning that through COVID. Yeah, I agree. In terms of active risk management as a mindset, as we continue to face multiple waves of disruption, who would have thought that a boat would have got trapped in the Suez Canal? Who would have thought that a piece of infrastructure would have led to fuel crisis, temporary fuel crisis in, in and around Texas? Who would have said we'd have a winter storm in Texas? You know, there's lots of things that have gone on which are kind of unusual under the cloak of a pandemic. If we have an active risk management mindset, would that... Would, I'm sort of going to answer my own question, really, by the nature of my question. I would imagine that would set us apart or at least allow us to proceed with some confidence that we can tackle a whole range of different things because we're already thinking yeah. about these things and planning yeah. out our way to, to cope with these rather than, as a uh, term you used earlier on, uh, being yeah. reactive, waiting for the event to happen yeah. but, and then yeah. firefighting the thing. Uh, um, perhaps for the audience, maybe, I don't know if you've got a client that was very reactive and you had to you know, get your, roll your sleeves up and really help them through a very difficult situation versus those ones who pull you in perhaps to to make sure we're on the right course but they are quite quite proactive right and, and, uh, you're right i mean i think i think of, of the the risk management conversation being similar to safety you know through the supply chain and at the warehouses and in the plants i said we're, we're most organizations have a safety culture because they talk about it every day they have a board that communicates safety expectations uh safety free days and all that good stuff when was the last time you you baked risk into that conversation when was the last time you you asked your teams, you know, what incidents reports have you seen? If you if you're in a in a warehouse situation with a thousand employees and you don't have any incident reports for the last three years, something's wrong. People aren't reporting it because they don't know how. They're not comfortable doing it. They don't want to quote unquote squeal. Stuff's happening. So I think that risk conversation has to be baked into everything we do, just like safety. I have a board that talks about incident reports at your team meetings. Spend five minutes asking what incidents. Uh, have been reported over the last month. So I think as it evolves, because it's always too late, you know, when do you worry about your furnace? Uh, when, it, when it breaks down in, in January, when it's minus 15. Well, that's not the time to worry about your furnace. You know, I have a, a client who had $60,000 worth of product stolen because somebody was ignoring a door open alarm that was broken for three months. They got the notification. They just didn't do anything about it. You know, mm -hmm. a trailer stolen out, still not of a yard because we haven't changed the alarm code to get into the gate for two years. Meanwhile, we, we've let 45 drivers go. Things like that. It's a blend. It's always a blend. There's never a silver bullet, but it's policies, procedures, audits, but it's just the conversation. And it's uh, walking the floor, spending time walking in the shoes of everybody that you lead and talking to them. Because like I said, they'll, they'll tell you all kinds of things that are going on and you should know. But I think in true risk management, it's something that's baked in annual strategic planning time and every day, throughout the supply chain and all of your operations. You mentioned something, uh, and we both talked about collaboration. Now we often might think collaboration is between say Walmart and its suppliers, but actually I think the closer collaboration between say us as leaders and our teams. And to the point that you made about actually being open about the incident reporting and being okay about it, say, oh, you know, somebody fell off a ladder or whatever, it, it gives us a chance to really get involved in that and just say, look, we better set out some procedures, give some training to people, make it okay for people not to take risks exactly. you know, to, yeah. to complete a task. And so I think collaboration starts in our own teams. Once we set the model for that, we can then be comfortable with collaborating with other suppliers. We had a couple of questions come in. I think I'm hoping we've done a fairly good service on the first one, which is what are the top 10 questions for a supplier resilience questionnaire? I, I, I suspect that you, you can't answer that from a standing start because you can only be general. But you, you did allude to a few few things uh, when absolutely. I posed that question, and you've been also adding adding some flavour to that during this conversation. But uh, have you got any other thoughts you'd like yeah, to share? Absolutely. So uh, I would ask your key suppliers: Have they? What are their top three risks? And if they don't know, that's a red flag. And then ask them how are they planning to mitigate those top three risks. I think that's a good start as well. 
And then you'll know right away whether they're doing any sort of risk assessment process themselves and who supplies them. You know, very few people will be able to tell you, you know, who supplies you, but who supplies your suppliers? So who are their top three suppliers? And what do they see as their top three risks that could really cause a significant disruption to their supply chain? And the third one, which is one that uh, I've yet to have any supplier confidently answer for me is, where am I on the list? If you get a significant supply chain disruption, where am I on the list of being fed your supplies? Because I know I'm not your only customer. So where am I on that list? That's a really interesting conversation for you to have with some of your key suppliers. And uh, you may be surprised by their answer. Yeah, and scarily surprised as well. So uh, Sarah's asked a question, or she's making a statement and asking a question. It's relatively easy for larger companies to do a comprehensive risk assessment, but I think that you, you may have some examples where you may, that's an assumption on the basis that you have the resources. They may actually have a security team or a risk management team, and certainly will if they're in retail loss prevention team. Uh, any suggestions, she asks, is there a best practice for smaller companies? And is there a best, best practice that is documented anywhere? Yeah, that's a great question, Sarah. I'm glad you asked. Because, because again, as I was trying to articulate earlier, it depends on your company culture and your and your resources as well. Not everyone can be a Fortune 100 companies for a risk assessment. I think it's, it's something, it can be something as basic as a lunch and learn and sitting down and, and asking people what, you know, what key risks they see and what incidents they're seeing. And then, you know, start with your four walls, you know, look at what's within your four walls, talk to your police, bring your police in, they'll give you some great information. You know, they're always a good resource in terms of what risks they're seeing based on their experience. They, they'll do a walkthrough of your facility and probably give you some key tips. So I think the police are a really good resource. And then there's lots of online material, your, your security vendor, whoever provides your security monitoring alarms, cameras, they probably have some resources as well. But I think it starts with your local team, your local employees and sitting down and, and what concerns them and then talking to police and, and some of your, your key vendors and getting them to support as well. Okay, is there any other question? I've got just one sort of burning question that I'd like to ask, but I was wondering if there's any other questions people want to ask while we, we're in full flight as such. Oh, I understand there's a couple more. So uh, Ian's asking, travel, I'm reading this out cold, travel restrictions have kept us away from many of our supplier facilities for obvious reasons. Uh, what are some of the worst impacts you've seen or you've seen, Dean, from a lack of on-site risk assessment at suppliers and perhaps how can they be mitigated? It's a great question, Ian. I'm glad you asked it. And I think that um, some suppliers uh, either co-produce or co-pack uh, together with other brands and, and the customers don't care if, you know, other, other companies were co-packing or co-producing in that one facility. If, if something happens from a labor relations or an incident point of view, it's all of our brands that are going to be impacted. So I think one of the, one of the biggest impacts is getting technology uh, into having some sort of verification uh, of what's happening in the site, but also relying on your local contacts. So as I said, other people in the industry what are they seeing? What are they doing? And then getting some verification from the facility offshore or overseas or whatever it might be, that's truly what's happening. But I think with technology, whether it's something as simple as Zoom and doing a Zoom walkthrough and getting uh, some verification that way, uh, there's lots of different ways that uh, technology can actually speed and improve both the number of risk assessments and the types that you do uh, and giving you greater confidence versus taking that uh, 12 or 20 hour flight across the pond somewhere to get some boots on the ground. There's a number of Canadian, local, the local Canadian embassy closest to that city can also offer some risk information. Uh, travel abroad. If you go to travel abroad, just Google travel abroad, uh, you'll pull up a, a Canadian sponsored a country risk profile, whether you're traveling personally, professionally, or doing business, they'll update it every so often. And you'll be able to do some sort of a, at a high level, of course, a country business risk assessment in terms of exactly what's happening and relying on the Canadian government and their risk intelligence sources that they have versus something you may see uh, on the local news. 
Good. Excellent. Thanks, Dean. I've got another question coming in from Jimmy. Is, is, is asked basically a couple of questions, but I'll just lay them in one at a time. COVID-19 has revealed the weaknesses of the globalised manufacturing system. And in order to respond and rethink supply chains uh, in the medium term, how should we put back human asset as the most important asset for an agile business to succeed? And I, I think I, I'll just add into that. How do we encourage our leaders to take positive decisions in the face of, you know, these uh, almost insurmountable levels of disruption? Uh, and I think risk management plays a very strong part in this. I'd be interested in what you think, Dean. Yeah, I think the best time to lead for all of us is during a critical incident. You know, people will remember how you treated them and what you do so that when you ramp up to full production, those people that you may have furloughed or lay off and you need to call back, they're going to want to come back if you treated them well. So I think that's, that's one of the most important ways that I've seen companies that I've worked with uh, come back to uh, same as normal or better than normal because they, they treated people well during that tough time and when they asked them to bring back. So I think that's the key way to uh, factor in the human assets where people first and employees of company X second. So I think always remember that throughout, uh, throughout all, of our, all of our dealings with humans and the importance of the human uh, will never go away. They're every company's most important asset. Some of them have been replaced by technology and will continue to be replaced by technology, but there's some, some functions of, and operations that'll have to always be human-based and, and human-driven. So I think uh, always remember that culture eats strategy every day of the week. And uh, we're all brand ambassadors and cultural ambassadors. So I think it's important in everything that we do to, to lead and remember to put people first. Jimmy also asks, uh, how is supply chain resilience measured? Yeah, good question. Qualitatively and quantitatively, like, like most things. So quantitatively, when are, you get, when are you back up to normal or better than normal? Is it days, weeks, or months after a disruption? And there's actual dollars and cents figures in terms of you having a business continuity plan and being back up in two days versus six days. You know, at, uh, at one of my previous companies, when the Eastern Canada blackout hit, we had service level agreements with a lot of milk producers. So we were literally first on the list getting milk to our stores and able to sell um, our products and services uh, within 36 hours versus a lot of our competitors still being dark. Having those service level agreements for diesel to bring into your power generators, things like that. So I think resiliency is technically measured in back to normal. Uh, for all of your processes and usually it could be if it's an I, if, if it's an IT function it could be hours um, but something longer is usually days and weeks and then qualitatively how safe do people feel to come back to work you know if there's an explosion in your building you need to do certain things call employee assistance talk to people uh, get them their benefits because you could do all the you know repairs but if people don't feel comfortable uh, come, coming back to work and safe to work then your resilience is very negatively affected so it's a it's a bit of both the questions are coming in thick and fast now so it's brilliant uh, uh amy asked and hello amy we've been in contact today actually weirdly um what new questions or metrics would would you ask for supply resilience with everything we've learned in the last two years so i i guess i think what what the question is what we learned in the last two years which would give us more a grip on on uh, risk management and resiliency yeah i, I think and, and, and some of them are, are are quite simple how many mock incident exercises have they done in the last two years hopefully it's it's more than zero what are your three biggest suppliers and as a percentage you know if one supplier is 60 percent of your supplier supply chain and that's a significant risk versus whether they have it spread out a bit more like peanut butter and the largest supplier is 10% of their supply chain. So those are some key met metrics in terms of how many mock incident exercises they have. Do you have a business continuity plan? I mean, that's a really simple question to answer, right? And, and how are your three biggest suppliers? Um, what percentage of, of your supply chain do those three biggest suppliers eat? I think those are key from a risk assessment point of view. I've got a question from my list. Are you, are you finding that businesses are considering tools such as scenario planning to help manage supply chain and business model risks? Or is uptake of such tools uh, being lower than expected? And what are your thoughts about how businesses should fully embrace security, loss prevention and risk management within their culture? No, I think, I think that's a really important. Whether you have somebody that you're able to dedicate full time 
um, to secure it or not. I think that somebody needs to own it. Somebody needs to champion it. You get the results you deserve. Inspect what you expect. We know all the catchphrases, but I think it has to be somebody that has to be focused on uh, security. And even if it's just the alarms, locks and gates and, and something simple like physical uh, to that, but it has to be a, a champion that thinks about it just like safety. And, uh, and some, some, some of my clients have a security leader on the safety committee and just do it that way, which is fine. I mean, you, you crawl, walk, run. I'm a big fan of crawl, walk, run. But I think that uh, if you try to manage, manage it only on an incident basis or when there's you know, a, literally a fire, I, th I don't think you're going to uh, ad advance your risk management process at all. Carl's asking a question. It's a, it's a great question, actually, because it, uh, he, he's linked a couple of things together here. How do you how do you think supply chains are going to adapt to the Great Resignation? There's there's a bolt from the blue. You know, people just don't turn up because they've left. Well, I think well, we saw it happen at South Southwest Airlines right last week and uh, or the week before, and it's happening at many many ports. And I think what's going to happen is businesses will figure it out. And some already have during COVID. And I think that some people, some jobs are going to get replaced with technology. I think that's number one. I think number two is people are going to be asked to take on more and their budgets may not be uh, increasing. Uh, so I think, and maybe even third is some of those um, reasons for great resignation, shall we say, might be, the companies might be flexible and change their minds um, because maybe it wasn't as well thought out as they, uh, they thought it was. And um, see, what I find is that uh, from a, a liability point of view, once one company in one industry takes a position, then maybe not because it's the perfect or right thing to do, but the same companies in the similar industry do the same thing because just for liability reasons, they don't want to say that they didn't follow the trend. So I think it takes a lot of leadership courage uh, to not follow that suit, but it has to be right for your company and right for the culture and is it defensible you know can you stand in front of your employees the people that you lead and say this is why we did something and sleep at night yeah. okay so um thanks for that dean we got questions at the moment if there's any last minute questions we can see in chat oh there is there is one sorry it's just popped in <laughs> Is there any analysis available on the cost of materials and services increase, decrease when organizations try to build resilient supply chains for an organization in the short and long term? There are quite a few studies and, um, you know, depending on, on who you rely on for your information, I know the World Economic Forum puts out a number of studies. I know, you know, most supply chain, well reputable supply chain organizations do. And I think once you, resiliency for me starts with a business continuity plan. And some of the ROI for a business continuity plan is that once you show that to many of your carriers, many of your insurers, your deductibles and maybe even some of your premiums will be reduced. So that's part of the ROI for building resilience. I think the word resilience and business continuity planning are interchangeable because you can't have one without the other. So I think having a strong, robust, living, breathing BCP business continuity plan um, will help you get to resilience. And then part of the ROI is show it to your insurers and your carriers, you may have a uh, reduction in your premiums because again, that will give them confidence that you have thought about your risks, assess them, prepared for them, and therefore will be uh, better able to recover from any of those risks coming to fruition. So I think that's a key uh, factor to consider to answer that question. So Agri is uh, just clarified some point. How can we assess that companies that have taken advantage of supply chain disruption will sustain that performance after stability is returned uh, and be focused on a company for us to put all on our priority vendor list and deal with going forward? Yeah, great question. I think, I think it's a multi-pronged approach. You ask some of their customers and don't ask them for the customer list because they're going to give you the customers that, that they're hitting home runs with. Right. Try to find out who they're not having home runs with. Try to ha find out some companies that they're frustrated by. And again, just uh, it's, it could be something as simple as an open source internet, open source internet search. Um, ask your insurers and your carriers if they've dealt with them. You know, do you have any em employees working for you that worked for them? So there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, and then just ask them directly, obviously. Um, but I think it, it's a multi-pronged approach as, as I've said before, and, uh, in the immortal words of Ronald Reagan, trust, but verify. 
with uh, everybody you engage in and allow into your supply chain. I don't think there's any more questions. I've uh, exhausted my questions. Uh, so is there anything you'd like to the audience to take away beyond what you've shared with them today, Dean, in terms yeah, I, of how to, how to approach loss prevention, risk management and security? I think su supply chain resilience is what you get when you make it a priority. And again, from the annual strategic planning process all the way uh, daily uh, along your logistics and warehouse and, and supply chain routes. Find out how resilient your top suppliers are. We've talked about ways to do that today. You know, get that resiliency questionnaire, ask them five questions, ask them who their top suppliers are, when the last time they did a tabletop exercise, which is a mock incident scenario. Um, you know, ask them if they have a business continuity plan. Those are three simple questions you, you could ask them and bake it right into your procurement process. So it happens every single time on every new or renewing contract. And I think that, and then to bring it internally, uh, a lot of my clients have had success developing a risk committee, you know, different functional leaders and they meet quarterly, talk about risks and what are they seeing from their different functions and how to mitigate those risks, both within their four walls. I did a risk assessment six months ago and a large, large warehouse facility. They didn't know who was operating, who was in the building 60 feet away from the next door. The person could have been manufacturing hush puppies or manufacturing nitroglycerin and they would have never known. Sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's within your four walls, but more importantly, it's, it's look around and what's your environment and um, what could bring you risk on, on any given day. Sound advice there. So thanks ever so much, Dean, for uh, sharing all your ex ex expertise in this area. I've enjoyed listening to it, frankly, and I've had my eyes opened all the way through today's sessions. It's been quite insightful. So uh, I'm going to hand back to the Supply Chain Canada team to just wrap, wrap us up and uh, thank the audience for participation, their engagement, some excellent questions, and uh, look forward to perhaps uh, catching up with them at some stage. I agree. Thanks for uh, everyone. Thanks for Gary. Thanks for the Supply Chain Canada team. Thanks for the audience for sticking with us during the end of the day. I know we're the only people stopping you from dinner, uh, depending on, uh, on, on the East Coast or whatever coast you might be on. So thanks for your time and engagement. Love the questions and love my time with, uh, with all of you. Yeah. It's actually one more session. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> So all good. Um, just want to take the chance to thank both Gary and Dean on behalf of Supply Chain Canada for such an engaging dialogue on supply chain resilience and also to spend time answering questions from our audience. So that was really good. Uh, and of course, I want to thank our attendees for hanging in for this late hour of the day um, and to ask some really good questions on the floor. Just a quick reminder to our SCMP members that uh, each conference session is worth two CPD credits to a maximum of 10 credits for the entire conference and county report your CPD activities in the member portal after the conference. Before we close off, just wanted to remind uh, each of you to click on the survey link on the right side of your screen. Uh, and also the, please continue to engage uh, our exhibitors and, and sponsor for the conference. And I just want to close off by saying uh, enjoy the rest of your night and the rest of the conference. And thank you very much to everybody again. Have a great night. Thanks everyone. Have a good evening. Thanks everybody. Thank you for listening today. I hope the information has been valuable for you and your team. You can connect with me via the website retail.ca and go to the contact page or via LinkedIn by typing linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash last dash mile. Look forward to hearing from you and playing an active part with your supply chain and your business's transformation as you start to act boldly, think big, scale, adapt and win. Thank you.